not easy to get a drink around here though. You know, there's visitors everywhere and the bar's right over there. But actually, Sophie, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know around you here. You know everybody, Yeah, Jeff. come on. Oh, nice. Well done. Good work. Nice, hey? hey, look at that, eh? Hey? Look at that. Hey, yeah, cheers. <laughs> mm. That's nice. Pretty good. Happy. Oh, did you want one? Mm, did actually. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2019. Now the sun is shining, the visitors are here and the pressure of the medal result is out of the way. We're taking a moment to reflect on everything Chelsea has to offer. And it is wonderful. Having been here a few days now, you really start to appreciate the, the small details of these gardens. You do. You look closer and things like the planting, the geranium, the fennel, the shadows there mm. and the lovely rills just pouring through this garden. It's beautiful. Certainly is. Certainly is. Well, coming up tonight from the RHS Chelsea Flower Show, an event supported by MG Investments. Chelsea may be an iconic British event, but it's also a stage for plants from all over the world. And tonight, Rachel Detain will be catching up with the team from Grenada as they bring delights from the Spice Island to the show. And Carol Klein will be showing you how to add some tropical flavour to your garden with the perfect exotic plants. A little closer to home, I'll be chatting to Lord of the Dance himself, Michael Flatley, about his own rather impressive garden in the Republic of Ireland. And well-known rose enthusiast Mary Berry explores some new varieties created by the legendary nursery, David Austin. But before all that, Chelsea really is a feast for the senses. You can see it, smell it, almost taste it. I've spotted some key trends at this year's show, each designed to tickle one of the five senses. So let's start with colour to excite our sense of sight. Now there's always purple here, it's just a part of the season, but this year there is loads, especially on Tom Stewart Smith's garden. But what he's done is plant it with volume and so that it really makes impact in the borders. And here he's got a beautiful Iris Sibirica with a complex but very elegant flower. We've got the upright petals and then the falls. It makes it so beautiful, hovering above that sword-like foliage. And your eye just drifts through a patch there over to the thelictrum. Thelictrum black stocking is all together a frothier form of flower. And the two combine really beautifully. And this is just a simple idea you could lift up and plant in your own garden. Scent can evoke such powerful memories of things like childhood holidays, young adventures or family meals together. And this year I've noticed a trend for aromatic plants, plants that release their essential oils when the sun bakes their foliage. So things like this, we've got Artemisia here and behind me a Santolina. But also along the path, those fragrances when they get baked in the sun are going to be released up right up the nostrils and as you sort of clip one with your shoe here and there it just bruises the foliage and releases even more scent. Now water in all its forms has always been a feature of Chelsea and whilst you might not be able to install a canal lock in your garden or a South American waterfall just installing a small fountain and the gentle splash can distract you from things that you don't want to hear. But it's all about getting the sound right. If it's too loud, it can be distracting and just a nice trickle is perfect. The most under-considered sense in the garden is probably the sense of touch. And we can get touchy feeling with the plants around us. But here on Jo Thompson's garden, she's thought about the hard landscaping and how she can bring texture into it. So here we've got these rusty, steely columns that, that you want to get nice and close to. And then this colonnade of stone arches. But of course, furniture. <laughs> it will always draw you to it 
Why? Oh, because it's the most comfortable part of any garden. Hmm, looks like I'm not the only one enjoying the textural tapestry here. Then, of course, there's everyone's favourite, the sense of taste. The whole of Chelsea is packed full of just beautiful edibles, perfectly grown, as you imagine. And here on the Montessori Garden, it's all about getting kids involved. So they've got a greenhouse and some fantastic planting here, all of which you can eat. But this green wall behind me, it just shows you know, what you can do. So we've got things like nasturtiums and coriander and tomatoes growing out of there. And also these little violas which are delicious too. But if you haven't got a wall, you can grow it in pots, you can grow it in spallier trees. There's always a way of getting edibles into a small garden. Yesterday, the judges named the M&G Garden best show garden. But do you think it's the best too? Whether you agree or disagree, now it's your chance to pick your favourite of the 11 large show gardens in the BBC RHS People's Choice Award. Voting will open at 9pm this evening after our BBC Two programme and it will close at 9.30 on Thursday evening. But if you haven't chosen your favourite yet, then don't worry, as tonight we'll be bringing you a guide to every one of the large show gardens. Here's Toby Buckland and Francis Tophill with a look at the first three contenders. This is the Dubai Magilis Garden, and designer Tom Hoblin took inspiration from the sand dunes, the traditional crafts, and the graphic designs from the Emirates City. Water plays a central role. It snakes its way down through the garden via a small stream, then a wadi, and ends up in a paisley-shaped pool that's the colour of the Persian Gulf. The soil is red because desert soils are full of iron, and when they're watered, they provide a wealth of plants from pomegranates, Persian ironwood, silver cochula, and lapis-coloured love in a mist. And the Magus, well, that's a meeting place where emirs and Bedouin can come together and break bread. The M&G Garden is designed by Andy Sturgeon and it is a representation of nature reclaiming a space, particularly after a forest fire. The hard landscaping is very warm in its colour and the whole space is intended to be very sculptural, featuring large burnt timber sculptures at the core of it. The planting is incredibly naturalistic. There are lots of trees, but they almost feel as if they're self-seeded here. And North of Vegas, Antarctica is the biggest statement of all these trees. The rest of the planting is predominantly green. There's loads of texture here. So there's Rogersia, Ecrocetum, Restios, and lots of different birds. And where there are flowers, they're very muted in colors. So lots of whites, soft blues, and just a few oranges, but nothing too strong or overpowering. The Warner Distillery Garden by Helen Elk Smith is inspired by a spring-fed sheltered courtyard and Helen has blended the colours you might see on a traditional gin still, the copper, verdigris and pattern of white in both the hard landscaping and the borders. There are copper-coloured irises and red orash and they rub shoulders with botanicals like fennel and lavender. There are also trees, a, a pear and a berry-bearing juniper that's been clipped to look like a super-sized gin balloon. Water plays a big part. It recycles and refreshes from fountains. And this garden has been designed for relaxing, both before and after the sun goes over the yard arm. <laughs> Well, that's your first three. Toby and Francis will be back later to guide you through the remaining large show gardens in contention for the BBC RHS People's Choice Award. Now, Chelsea is a fantastic place to see plants from all over the world, and our very own exotic bloom, Carol Klein, has been in search of some tropical beauties. Thank 
think of the tropical and where does your mind go straight away? To the Caribbean with its glorious colours. And this stand from Barbados is a perfect example of that. You can almost feel the heat. You can feel the palm trees swaying. There are all manner of gorgeous plants here. Heliconiums, red gingers, anthuriums, all completely different from any of the things that you're used to seeing in your own garden. But immediately, you're transported. Canners have to be the go-to plants if you want to create a tropical effect in your garden. For a start, it's these huge entire leaves, often in dark shades, burgundy and white. And then, as if that wasn't enough, you get these glorious flowers. Oranges, corals, pinks, reds. They're so straightforward to grow, really easy. Just make sure that you protect them from frost during the winter. Dig them up, bring them in in the spring, get them going again and feed like mad all the way through the summer. You don't necessarily have to have brightly coloured flowers to achieve a tropical effect. Sometimes you can just do it with foliage. It can add shape, texture, structure to your garden and really make you feel that you're somewhere much, much warmer than you really are. I think these beautiful palms illustrate that exactly. If you want something really small and chunky, this one's called Camerops Humulus Volcano. And they're hardy down to minus 10. With a straightforward, simple plant like this, your garden can change from a cottage garden to a perfect tropical paradise. You don't necessarily have to use tropical plants to create a tropical effect. Here on Sarah Abelie's resilience garden, she's shown how you can actually use plants that are in everyday parlance and add a splash of something or other. A yucca here, a beautiful cycad there, combined with the plants we're all used to seeing. And yet, you look at either of these places and you're transformed, taken away to a different reality. One or two orchids growing in pots can transform your living room into an exotic haven. The team from Grenada never failed to bring a taste of the exotic to Chelsea. Just look at this extraordinary display. Rachel will be meeting the person who designed it shortly. But it's not just about flowers here. They've also brought with them an array of Caribbean spices. We visited an expert grower in Grenada to show us exactly how they're produced. Guido Marcel, Dr. Guido Marcel. <laughs> I'm a pharmacognosist located in Felix Park in the state of Grenada. And you know, Grenada is one of the southernmost islands in the Eastern Caribbean. I'm into what I call natural farming. I do um, herbs, spices, flowers, fruits and vegetables. And I've developed a term for my type of farming, which I call G-tensive farming. It's, na it's not named after me, <laughs> but it, it's more related to good agriculture or generative agriculture. It just happens to coincide with my name too. So it becomes G-tensive. This is a turmeric stool, Kakuma longa. It's an underground rhizome. So the leaves dry down in the dry season and it's that beautiful orange. It would grow from pieces and also from the, the stalk here. Just put in one piece and you'll get a stool. Relatively very rich soil, almost Anything could grow in it. It's used in a national dish, the oil dung. The oil dung is made from breadfruit. So the turmeric is an integral part. So we come this way. I 
I'm going to show you this clove plant, which is actually in bloom. One has to be very careful because to harvest, you're looking at it when the buds have just started to be at this state. Um, to harvest, you just bring it. Then you'll put this to dry for it to mature, to become the spice. Don't let your clove pass or go to the fruit. Then it becomes the mother of clove. And this is no longer spicy. Well, I started here in 1987. So that makes me about um, 32, about 32 years I've been on this spot here. Apart from being um, relaxing and revitalizing for me, what I look forward to is maybe um, sharing information with um, other farmers, with children in particular, because I'm looking forward to the next generation of scientists and entrepreneurs. This is a beautiful clump of cinnamon, the true cinnamon, cinnamon verum. Usually when we are harvesting, we actually cut the entire plant and then you proceed with scraping and, you know, have something. But I'll, I'll cut this small branch to show you. You actually want to get the bark. So you're removing the skin, the outer layer, the epidermis, you're removing the outer layer. Then you'll start lifting off the back. So this is what would give you your cinnamon, your true cinnamon. A beautiful nutmeg fruit. Nutmeg is on the Grenada flag. <laughs> it's part of our culture. Nutmeg is the main spice that caused Grenada to be called the Spice Isle of the West. The beauty of nutmeg is from nutmeg you get two spices. The seed, which is covered by the red coat, which is a mace, which gives you one spice, and the seed inside gives you another spice. And we have a scene in Grenada the lady in the boat with the red petticoat. That's a jingle for nutmeg. I know by the Chelsea Flower Show, yes. I've never visited it personally, but I also know that um, Grenada has been doing very well in it. <laughs> and it's one of the things I'm proud of. I think Grenada can offer spices to the world. We can spice up you're living <laughs> by giving you a spice for all season and a spice for the right reason. <laughs> I'm here at the Grenadian display with Catherine Johns, who's responsible for really curating and putting it all together. And we were seeing about those spices, which is wonderful. How have you incorporated them across the display? Because the display is a carnival theme, we thought at Carnival, which is one of our biggest traditional displays, we thought to add some spice in the carnival theme would be great. And you've just dotted things across the stand? Across the stand, yes. So they're everywhere among us. Yes. Them. And there's also this wonderful shell. What's the that come Nutmeg from? shells. We use almost every part of a nutmeg. We use the pericot, we use the nutmeg, the mace, the shells, everything. So nothing goes to waste. And it nothing. makes a beautiful mulch, doesn't it? It is. Really it's attractive. wonderful. Now, what amongst the flowers are you most proud of? I, I am proud of, should I say, everyone. <laughs> I, I just love them all. No favorites? The, no, they, they're so beautiful. And wherever you go, you would find a new heliconia. Mm -hmm. We've got a heliconia on the opposite side. One of my team members went up in the mountains and found this new heliconia. 
So that that was exciting, That's very exciting. Very exciting. And yes. you brought it here to the And show. we brought it here to Chelsea, it's and it's amazing. new. We know it's a helicopter, but it hasn't got a registered name yet, as it, it's mutated out in the mountains. And you've got, of course, the gold medal. Wouldn't expect anything less from you. Do you feel that after so many years of doing so well, does it mean perhaps a little less to you? How do you feel no, about it? No, it, it, it's not less, it's more. <laughs> <laughs> we are so excited that we can win that many gold medals. It, it's hard work, but at the end, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. you, you forget everything about the hard work. You know, it's worth all of it. It's worth it. Is it? Yes, <laughs> exciting uh, to have 15 gold medals for Grenada. And as you know, Grenada is very small. Mm -hmm. And to obtain 50, 15 gold medals at the world's most prestigious for our show. It's amazing. It really is something. Amazing. Maybe small in size, but huge, huge. horticulturally. That's and right. we're very blessed to have you here again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Chelsea has always been a magnet for creative people. And whilst he made his name in the world of dance, you'd be surprised to learn that my next guest has discovered a passion for gardening on a pretty large scale. Welcome, Michael Flatley. Joe, how are you? Michael, love you, sir. I like the hat. <laughs> I was thinking the same about hey. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you need it today, thank God, huh? I know, it's a beautiful day. It's fantastic. Gorgeous day yeah. in Chelsea. Yes. But you, you've, been, you've been involved in a huge restoration project, a house and a garden, haven't you? Yeah, I discovered a love I didn't know I had, if I'm honest. I didn't grow up with a big garden or anything, but I bought a property in Cork in Ireland called Castle Hyde in 1999. A uh, beautiful, magnificent old home, but it was uh, derelict at the time. But what attracted me was the magnificent gardens, the timber on that estate. Uh, some of it dating back uh, 500 years, the old Irish and English yew trees. Have you got some beautiful beech trees and copper beech trees and oak and maple? What, so what scale are we talking? 150 acres about, okay. yeah, and uh, it's on the River Blackwater. Yeah. Uh, which is um, really just such a very picturesque setting and we have some formal garden but it took me many many years uh, to bring it back uh, because there was a lot of old man beard and an awful lot of laurel that had was overgrown so yeah. I had uh, a number of tree surgeons for 10 years when I first bought the place I bought it in 99 and they worked tirelessly to bring back the life of the real timber that was there. That's fantastic. We discovered a magnificent uh, uh, Spanish chestnut tree, that, oh, it's just a, a powerful big tree, and I'd never seen anything quite like it, and from that moment on, I think it was hooked. You know, it was just yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Tree, I mean, there's some fantastic trees. Yeah. Do you like spending time in the garden? Oh, and, yeah. yeah, just meandering, you know wandering what? around. Great for your mind, great yeah. for your peace of mind. It balances your energy, it does something that I think that uh, all children would benefit from to be around the greenery, be around fresh air, even the water. It's nice to have a little bit of water, huge. And what I'm impressed about today was uh, you know, all the different types of people and different ages of people that are here today. Different languages are here as I'm walking by. It's an international and, show. And everybody loves this. Yeah. Everybody loves it, you know. Have you said, have you, is there stuff that's caught your eye in particular here? Well, it's uh, difficult not to love uh, the one that the Duchess did. Yes. Uh, for me, I love the simplicity. I, I wasn't, you know, wasn't in any way uh, um, made up or contrived. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it's not natural. highly designed. You no. feel as if you're in a woodland. You though. are. You, it's just what you might find as a wee child yeah. when you're growing up. Yeah. But I just thought it was so simple and so elegant and so real. It just was very honest. And that's the one that I, I think got me. Uh, most uh, yeah. so yeah very impressive but there was what about the pav have you been inside the pavilion yeah yeah um, <laughs> they, they, there's a left wall in there with flowers I, I don't even know the names Joe to be honest but it was an explosion of color yeah and then uh, there was a magnificent bonsai tree that I spotted from 1928 yeah. never seen anything you know, quite like it in my life. How They're incredible. Yeah, the bonsais are amazing, aren't they? Yeah, and the bonsai nursery. So everyone's here for weeks on end. You know, get it, get him already. Bonsai guys just come along, plop them out. Unbelievable. Oh, lovely. Another medal. But you know what? Have you spotted me? anything for your garden here? Oh God. That you might. That you think I've got to have that. Oh my I've God. Got, I mean, you've got 150 acres. There's Michael. so many. My wife don't get her started. No, <laughs> I'll be running out of plastic very quickly if I start shopping here. But uh, no, it's so impressive. And um, I just want to say. The, the people that did this work, they work all year, 
and maybe don't get the credit they deserve until this week. And isn't it brilliant that we get a chance to come and enjoy their genius for one week? Yeah. It's exciting. Best week of the year. It surely is. It certainly yeah. is. Michael, it's lovely to meet you. Joe, lovely to see you. Thanks for the time, mate. Thank you. Thank That's you. Fun. Earlier, we showed you the first three large show gardens that you can vote for in the BBC RHS People's Choice Award. Here's Toby and Francis with a look at the next four. The Wedgwood Garden is designed by Joe Thompson and inspired by a village that Wedgwood created for their workers back in the Victorian times. As such, it features lots of arches. It's a very strong theme as you move through the garden. And they're made from rusted steel and stone, which is repeated throughout the whole space. Underneath the arches is a square pool that reflects that and again repeats those same materials. But all that hard landscaping is balanced out by lots of planting out in the sunny areas, the designer has intended to use some experimental colour schemes with coppers and pinks like irises, roses and peonies. But there are a lot of trees that create shaded areas and those shaded areas have a much more muted palette, so things like Anthriscus sylvestris and Astrantia. Here in Tom Dixon, Gardening Will Save the World is a garden of two halves. And unusually for a show garden, it's indoors in the Great Pavilion. Functionality is prized over beauty here. And every single plant on this green ziggurat is either useful or edible. So there's kale, there's hops, and that Swedish favorite, dill. Meanwhile, in the laboratory underneath, Cutting edge grow lamp and hydroponic technology are on show, illustrating that even if we don't have soil or a garden, it's possible for all of us to grow our own food. The Resilience Garden by Sarah Eberly is designed to be a rural British landscape, but one that's able to cope with the changing climate and all the pests and diseases that that brings. The trees, rather than being native, are mainly non-native species, like Liriodendron, Metasequoia and Ginkgo. And underneath the trees, there's a lot of meadow planting, but not with usual species, so things like Echium are quite prominent in these schemes. Around that, there's also lots of ferns and lots of arid planting. So there's yuccas and aloes that can cope with much less rainfall. A lot of the garden has been upcycled. In fact, the wall is made from an old silage bay. And in the middle of the garden, the whole scheme is dominated by a huge upcycled silo. Running through the DNA of the Morgan Stanley Garden, designed by Chris Beardshaw, is an environmental awareness. The canal, running down the centre, was dug out by electric diggers, and the relaxation pods designed for seating in, well, they aren't steel and stone, but timber clad with a thin veneer. Now, while the structures are lightweight, the trees are anything but, this black pine is huge, and at its feet are gargantuan yew balls to anchor Chris's trademark planting. It's like a bouquet of flowers in the border. There's iris, orange isoplexus and, and scented sweet rocket. This garden is as much about process as finished product. seen more than half of the gardens so far. We'll have a reminder of the last four shortly. But right now, we're in one of the artisan gardens. This, this is the Kingston Moorwood Garden, designed by Michelle Brown. And it's, it's lovely, isn't it? It's a really nice place to shelter from the crowds. It's a fabulous little space, and it's great design, actually, for a tiny space like this to get... I mean, it's a two-metre diameter circle here. You can seat around eight people intimately in a space like this. You've got a built-in back. It's really mm, comfortable. I love nice. it. I Sit love back, it. Sit back, relax, look at the beautiful 
beautiful flowers that she's planted. Exactly. Um, and it's all about time, isn't it? The circles and uh, the sundial, the sort of sundial. Yeah, so what time is it? This <laughs> Come on, head girl. <laughs> hey girl, you must be able to work this out. What time is it right now? I'm missing half a sundial and there's no sunshine, So and I have no watch, so I can't tell you. Maybe you need to plug it in or something. Oh, you probably do, don't you? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's great. And I saw Michelle when, when she got her silver gilt, and she was in, in floods of tears before she got it. She was so emotional, so pleased to just be here. And then you know, some people, they're like, oh, it's not a gold. She got a silver gilt, and even more tears came out. She loved it, and I was there at the most very special moment oh, at Chelsea. Lovely. Well, it's a very nice place to be. <laughs> well, still to come tonight from the RHS Chelsea Flower Show, Mary Berry gets a glimpse of some brand new rose varieties when she visits the world-famous nursery David Austin. Harriet Anderson reveals the key ingredients for creating a Mediterranean garden. And Adam Frost shows you how to use aquatic plants in your garden, no matter how big or small it is. Now, when you think of a Chelsea flower show, I doubt that donkeys would be the first thing that spring to mind. However, this year, one pair of garden designers have put these hard-working animals front and centre in their garden. And we caught up with them before the show to find out why. You mean the designers, not the donkeys? That's right. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, by chance we were both riding, and I saw this rather beautiful horse and quite a smiley girl on top of it. And I said, "Hi, I'm Christina. I live here." And so I said, "Well, I'm Annie." And then she said, "Oh, I think you might come in for supper." We each have four children three boys and one girl. girl. We both went to university in London and both love gardening. She's cleverer than me and she's That's better at computers than me. <laughs> I like all the geeky stuff. She's a geek and I'm the, she's like the, the chaotic creative one. one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine life without her really. No. <laughs> no. Wouldn't be nearly as much fun. <laughs> I've been practicing as a designer for 15, 20 years, and I tried working on my own for about 18 months and really found it rather um, rather lonely. And I think we've both been kind of thinking about whether we should hook up. We just sort of almost blurted it out at the same time. Why don't we give it a go? And um, luckily she said yes. One of the first joint projects we did together was in 2010 and we won gold and best in category for the Artisan Garden and now we're in it again. We got a call from the Donkey Sanctuary and they asked if we would do a garden at Chelsea. It's the 50th anniversary this year and I think they had quite a sophisticated message how, you know, many parts of the world donkeys are really the, well we call it the white van of the developing world. I don't think we had any idea how important they were. Certainly I didn't. I feel very lucky that I get to do this because it's, it's just a joy, really. The Donkey Sanctuary were very keen that we concentrated on water and the many journeys that donkeys take carrying water for people in, in very difficult landscapes where you can't get a car, for example. So it's about water being taken from the well up into the hills. One of the things donkeys do is uh, help with lavender harvest. So we've then got a, a bank with lavender planted on it. And the path goes through that and up to the top level, which is supposed to indicate a more mountainous area. Obviously, we can't have a donkey there all week. Eat all our plants. Yes. <laughs> so this is an environment where the donkey has literally gone out to work, but there's evidence of it everywhere. So, you know, we have the rails on the side which have been chewed by the donkeys. We'll have yeah, donkey poo, and then there will be donkey hoof prints in the paths. It's been over a year since we started working with them on the garden. Fun to be back. And today we'll come to update them on how progress is going. Let's do it. Hello. <laughs> They're just adorable, aren't they? Irresistible. And so lovable. 
Thanks for coming down. Not long to Chelsea now. Can you tell me how it's all going? Well, I think we're quite pleased, aren't we? Well, so far, so good. We've got two sort of main worries. One is the Iris Langport Wren, which is an early flower, and that Easter hot weather has mm. pushed it on. But we've got several batches at different stages of flower growth, so hopefully one of those will peak at the right time. And the other problem is the lavender. You know, we have this bank of lavender, and the lavender used to be imported from Spain, but we can't do that at the moment because of this virus, Zydella. Mm. So we're growing it in the UK. It's quite difficult to get lavender and flour mm. for it's Chelsea. Early. It's a bit yeah. early, but fingers <laughs> crossed they'll be all right. <laughs> This has been something that is obviously very different from the type of work that we do, both here and overseas. Not just supporting donkeys, but supporting the many, many communities that still depend upon them for livelihood. I think the amazing job that Annie and Christina have done is to somehow encapsulate within the garden this interdependency between people and their working donkeys in a way that's incredibly beautiful. <laughs> They're more than just a cute animal. They're really, really important for many people. Christina, Annie, here we are on the garden. I mean, when we hear donkey sanctuary, it's like, what's the garden going to look like? But it's beautiful. Are, are you pleased with the garden? Oh, we're thrilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah we really love it. Thrilled. It's yeah, exactly how we imagined it would be on paper. It's come alive. Yeah, the planting is I mean, it's sort of it's the sort of planting people can really relate to, isn't it? Yeah, people love seeing flowers, I think, and seeing pops of colour. And, you know, we've had really, really positive um, response to the vibrancy of this lower planting, I think. So the, the Circeum people are interested in, and obviously the irises, everyone loves an iris at Chelsea. Um, and then over there we've got that bright pink lickness. Yes. Um, hills ground, which Just is popping lovely. out through here. I mean, this is a lot more planty area, and then we've got to get onto the, uh, the lavender bank. Yeah. And the, the xylella was a bit of an issue, but you've got, you've got fabulous lavender in flower. Yeah, we, we had it grown at a nursery in Kent, because, you know, we can't import because of xylella. So we uh, down dairy nursery in Kent grew it for us, and we think they did just an amazing job. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a month early, so to get it looking this good. And you had donkeys here on the garden. <laughs> yes. oh, I mean, they didn't eat the whole thing, which no, is a good sign. No, they came in the back gate. <laughs> <laughs> they, had a, they had a bit of a nibble at some of the daisies, but they were really, really sweet and well behaved. And they were so good. The photographers were more of a problem with the planting. <laughs> and one of them left a little present behind me. I've never seen a donkey poo on a garden at Chelsea ever before. That's a first. Well, you know, we try and be original. <laughs> try and be authentic. Authentic. Bring authentic. the donkeys in. Yeah. It definitely brings the, the donkey in. Um, you, got a, you got a silver medal. At the, at the time, you were a bit muted about the response. How are you feeling about it now? Well, well, well you know, look, we're, we're really happy. It's We think it's lovely. And, and we were given some good advice, which is to look at the people looking at the garden. And we've had such positive feedback. And, and that's really lifted us. And now we're just really happy. You know? Yeah, I mean, people, everyone's been talking about your garden. They've been saying, well, how beautiful and how they can relate to it. You know, it, there's lots of little areas of planting um, and the lavenders they love and the backdrop and the fig at the back and, uh, mm. and the way it tears mm. up. Mm. I, think, I think you've done a fantastic job enjoy the week relax <laughs> and just just stand here and listen to the love well there's some great examples of Mediterranean planting on this garden and if you've ever dreamed of having a taste of the med in yours Aaron's here with some top tips just come back from holiday, your nostrils are still full of the heavy scents of jasmine, your eyes have been tantalised by pelagoniums and bourgainvillea. But the thing is, how do you get that med look? Well, I'm going to take you on a little journey around the showground and give you some top tips. Laura you've designed the harmonious garden of life, which is amazing and full of Mediterranean plants. But can you give me a couple that you think would be good for the UK climate? I think that the myrtle could be fantastic and um, provide beautiful little fragrance flower. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can talk also about the nipita that's bloomed a long time with these little purple flowers and which are honeybees. And then any 
advice on how to look after Mediterranean plants? So my advice would be that you never water them when the sun is out because they do not support to be sprayed on the foliage. Ah, that's a very good tip. In the Mediterranean, it's not just about all of the flowers and all the wonderful scent. It's also about really standout trees. Now, we often think of the olive tree. I want to show you this one. This is the pomegranate tree, and I think it's really beautiful. I love all of its gnarly bark and the different colour tones you get in the leaves. It's deciduous, the leaves will trot, but that's all part of its charm. If you are ambitious and you do want to have a go growing this yourself, I do advise that you have a greenhouse because it will need to keep warm while it's establishing. But it's worth a go. It's a fantastic tree. What typifies the Mediterranean more than the Bougainvillea? I absolutely love it. If you have a sun-baked corner in your garden and you feel confident that you're not going to get any frost, say temperature's only going to go down to about, I don't know, five degrees, then by all means you could try growing Bougainvillea outside. However, it does need to have um, warm temperatures year-round. For an instant Mediterranean hit, the Pelagonium is the go-to plant. It's cheap, it's easy to look after, and it just keeps giving, and it's one of my favourite plants. You can use it in planters, in pots on your windowsill, just keep deadheading, and as long as the frost doesn't come in, I assure you this plant will make sure that you feel like you're on your favourite holiday for years to come. I hope I've shown you that you don't have to live in the Mediterranean to have a slice of the Mediterranean in your own back garden. He was one of the best known rose breeders of all time, a man who was so well known here in the Great Pavilion. But sadly, back in December, David Austin died at the age of 92. He spent six decades breeding beautiful, fragrant roses and sharing his passion for them with people here at Chelsea and all over the world. But his nursery lives on. And Mary Berry, a fellow rose devotee, went to meet David Austin Jr. to see how he's continuing his father's work. I've always loved roses. They're romantic, they're beautiful, and I especially love the pastel shades. One of the great highlights of my year is coming to Chelsea. And when I think of roses, I think of David Austin. So I've come to his home to find out more about the man behind the roses. I'm meeting David's son, also named David, in the family's private garden. Look who we've got here. <laughs> we've got the peacock. <laughs> a great friend of yours. Yeah. How did your father first become involved with roses? It came from an um, interesting gardening, really. From a very young age, he was designing gardens for his mother, and he just used to look at seed catalogues when he was a boy, and, and then he got into the idea of plant breeding, and he had an ambition right from the beginning to do something in terms of plant breeding, and he picked the rose because he felt there was something he could do with the rose. The rose at the time was dominated by the hybrid tea, which he didn't like. He loved old-fashioned roses, which he'd seen in his own garden. First success was Constance Spry in 1961. Uh, he had been breeding roses then for well over 20 years, but Constance Spry was actually only a once flowering rose, um, so it was just the start. How many roses in the whole of your father's life did he uh, produce? He was quite prolific. Um, <laughs> three to five a year, and it numbers over 200. You've been breeding roses for yonks. Has the ethos changed? The basic idea of a repeat flowering old-fashioned rose and a more beautiful rose is still at the core of everything we do. To create a more beautiful rose takes time, dedication and expertise. Would you like to have a go? Yes. Gently to tap, like you did? Yes. So I've come to meet Carl Bennett, head of breeding. You knew David's father really well. You worked with him for many years. How many years? Uh, 30 years. Most look, of those very closely. You don't look old enough. So, um. <laughs> so how do you start about breeding roses? The whole idea about breeding is to observe 
what a rose will give you in terms of characteristics. So we're always trying to improve what we already have. Mostly it's disease resistance. How many roses do you start with? As parents, we've got hundreds, because we're looking for so many different characteristics, so we have lots of different varieties. But over the course of the season, that will produce maybe 300,000 seeds. Goodness gracious. Will they that, all come to fruition? Not all of them, no. Maybe 100 to 150,000 seedlings, and they're all unique. Every and you're quite one. good at maths as well. Ish. So, Mary, these are the 100,000 seedlings I was telling you about. So, you walk down here looking at all the flowers, just as you did with David Austin Sr., you would put a stick Very much on so. the one that you like. That's right, yes. Out of all these, I will select six to 10,000 by the end of the summer, and they'll get propagated into our trials fields, which then they really start to get evaluated, and that'll go on for another five, six, seven years. Gracious. Out of all the masses of flowers here, you're only looking for how many? Out of all these 100,000, two or three. Gosh, it is a long process. Do you have a favourite that's been through all this lengthy process? For me, it's probably this one, Princess Anne, which you actually made 10 years previous. Very resistant. I don't know about being resistant, but it has a knockout smell. I had no idea it took so long to create such a beautiful rose as this. David, two beautiful roses. Is this what you've got new for Chelsea? It is indeed. Unfortunately, not yet in flower. You'll have to wait till Chelsea to see the in bloom. But this is Eustacea Vi. This is a peachy pink rose, highly scented, beautiful rose, very subtle. And on the right we have here Gabriel Oak, which is a deep pink, again multi-petal, and an extremely healthy rose. This is going to be your first Chelsea without your father. How is that going to be? Mm, it's going to be a little bit emotional for us all, but um, we intend to, to do him proud. So we're, we're, we're going to try and put on a great show for him. He's looking down. I'm here in the heart of David Austin's stand, surrounded by glorious roses. It brings me back to when I was a child and I used to make rose petal perfume and everybody said it was really rather good. David, I saw these in bud, and it's so exciting to see this blaze of colour. I'm dying to smell them. Let me have a look. Oh, that is sheer heaven. What it's a It's incredible. Depth. It's incredible. It's a very fruity fragrance. Incredibly strong. And this is Gabriel Oak, named after Tom, Thomas Hardy novel. Um, it's a beautiful rose. I'm really pleased to see it's obviously in flower. And the second rose you've got... Eustacea vine, that's equally fragrant, it's absolutely incredible. Two highly fragrant varieties and we're, we're delighted. What has been the reaction from people when they've seen the stand this year? Uh, we're very, very honoured that every year we come to Chelsea we get so many lovely, lovely comments and I think this year is obviously no different. Um, the stand has got a little bit more space, we have this beautiful uh, inner garden within a garden that we call inspired by a secret garden i think people are really liking that which part of the display are you most proud of if there was one feature that i really love is the use of the hedges which we have at either end of the stand so we have a desdemona hedge along the one side and then at the far side we have emily bronte and they they look stunning so i'm really proud of those this year again another goal how many have you had this is our 25th gold medal, which is obviously amazing for us to think. How um, proud your father would be. Absolutely, and obviously this is uh, the first year that he's not with us. Um, and we're extremely honoured that the RHS allowed us to do a, a, something in memory for him. And we have a, a, a beautiful display around the memorial stand right in the centre of, of the show. Um, and that's very poignant. 
David, thank you. I'm sad to leave this paradise. That's very kind of you to say. Always make a beeline for the David Austin exhibit and never disappoints. Now it's time for Francis and Toby to take a look at the final four gardens competing for your vote in the BBC RHS People's Choice Award. The Savills and David Harbour Garden is designed by Andrew Duff. It's the imagining of an urban public space that's designed to be as environmentally sustainable as is possible. Essentially, it's a woodland that's surrounded by a living wall. The bare bones of the design are very modern with big rectangular blocks of stone that create all of the features, including a patio and a staggered edge to a huge pond, which is at the center of the garden. And in that pond is an enormous conical sculpture. The planting is essentially reclaiming that modern landscaping. There's lots of trees and they're all native, so alder, elder and field maple. And underneath those trees is a lot of, again, very naturalistic planting, some of which would be considered weeds in many people's opinions. So things like buttercups and cow parsley. In the pond, there are masses of iris pseudochorus. The most striking feature of the trail finder's undiscovered Latin America garden by Jonathan Snow is this wing-shaped paprika red walkway. It flies up and opens out into a deck that offers a bird's eye view of the plants below. Jonathan's design is about travel, the adventure, the daring do of going to far-flung places. That's why there are changes of level and cascades that splash water onto your feet. And just as when you're abroad, the familiar on closer inspection turns out to be anything but, so it is with this apparently naturalistic planting. That's not lichen in the trees, it's Spanish moss. And these aren't Scots pine, they're monkey puzzle trees, all growing cheek by jowl, just as Jonathan saw them on his travels to South America. The Green Fingers Garden by Kate Gould is designed to be put outside a children's hospice and provide a space for all the family to spend valuable time together. As such, it's full of very interactive and very sensory features. There are water features that produce trickling noises and lighting. It's set over two layers, but the whole thing is accessible by wheelchairs. The bottom level is for fun and games and there's lots of seating areas. The top level is for relaxation, the planting is much more muted and there's a big cargo net where everyone can lie down and look up at the stars. In terms of the planting, it's designed to be evergreen, so there's lots of pines, lots of shrubs and trees. And the flowers have a very limited colour palette. There's lots of whites like Eremus, roses and orlayers, and lots of greens like Angelica and Dixonia. And little accents of yellow, so lupins, irises and aquilegias. This is Mark Gregory's Welcome to Yorkshire Garden. And it's about transportation, both back in time, but also of the heft of industrial heritage in West Yorkshire. But it's not just canal boats that wend their way down the waterways. Oh no, wild flowers move down them too. And there are plenty of weeds running them up, both just in the hedgerows and in the borders out the front of the cottage. Meanwhile, the veg garden has provided weeds of its own with wild strawberries, running away underneath the foxgloves and the willow. It's also about wildflowers and how they'll colonise even the front of a, a wooden lock gate. Details of all 11 large show gardens are on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash Chelsea. The vote opens at 9 o'clock tonight. It closes at 9.30 tomorrow night. Joe and I will be announcing the winner of the BBC RHS People's Choice Award on Friday evening here on BBC One. Now with aquatic plants all the rage, Adam's back to show you how to use them in your garden to maximum effect.
I know we're not all going to build a canal, but designer Mark, the bit that's interests me is the way that he's planted it. He's gone very much with a native palette, and I think if you're going to create a wildlife pond in your own back garden, that's a great thing to keep in mind. I tend to draw a radius around my garden or a garden that I'm working on and, and pick natives that will grow in water and around water and by doing that you're then creating an environment for that local wildlife. And when it comes to planting ponds and around ponds, you pick up a book and it can feel quite complex but there is little ways that can help you understand what to put in the pond but also what to put around it to give you I suppose that atmosphere and the feeling that you want. This demonstrates a lot about marginal planting. You see over there at the Equisetum is fantastic verticals with a tiny little black detail. But what's interesting as well is the planting around though, it looks really quite comfortable and as if it is that bog loving plants, a lot of it will go well in a normal garden soil. Things like the Regersia and the Aruncus. So you really can get that feel without having those boggy conditions. comes to aquatic plants I'm not sure there's anything more beautiful than a water lily. The discs that just float elegantly and the flowers are stunning, they really are. But when you're choosing these plants be mindful. You know I tend when I'm planting a pond not to want more than 50% of the surface area planted and plants like those can put on a lot of growth over a season so you might only need one or two. Sometimes with this Less is more. That is a gunnera. Fantastic architectural plant. To me, they're like an upside down umbrella. They capture that water and it runs down the stem and goes and feeds those roots. I tend to grow that in a pot and I'll put it in water through the summer months and then lift it out in the winter. It means I can control the growth of the plant when you're choosing marginals, aquatics, be mindful, do a little bit of research, you know, don't impulse buy, because some of them can be a little bit thuggish. The wonderful sound of water everywhere at Chelsea. The other thing I love about Chelsea, there are always these little corners that you can come away and escape. Lovely little tranquil corner for one. Yep, my seat one for seat one. In it. I'll just stand over here. I'll, I'll, I'll polish this car or something. I'm always the one doing all the hard yeah, work around work, here. Joe Swift, come on. Oh, Actually, while I sit here and relax, you have got to go off and find Monty for the show, which is about to start on BBC Two. I know. No, you just take it. Don't worry about a thing here, girl. <laughs> you take it nice and easy. Yes, we're going to be meeting broadcaster Clive Anderson and finding out why trees are making such a big impact at the show and we will be back together here on BBC One on Friday night at half past seven with loads of gardening ideas to take you into the bank holiday weekend and we'll be revealing your winner of the BBC RHS People's Choice Award a little bird tells me that you're going to get to meet Fraser of all people. Kelsey Grammer, how come you get that gig, head girl? You're a bit jealous, aren't you, head gardener? Just a bit. Uh, sorry, all mine. Mm, well, I can't wait to find out what he makes of such a very British event. Well, I better be off. I'll see you over on BBC Two in a moment. Goodbye. Goodbye. You just went out. I will. No, I'll just see you.